And I really do believe in social capital connections for connection's sake, because I know what it's like. So what I used to say is, uh, which so funny is not true anymore, but I used to say when I started LIT, I didn't have a network or a net worth. And so I had to figure out how to build that own community itself. And so I think bringing people along in the process, I'm not about, you know, what can I get out of it? I don't think about it like that. I think about how can I create with the position of power that I have structure and systems where people will get together and they'll find their own collaborations within each other. And it's okay that maybe it's five, 10 years down the line. You're tuned into Compassionate Las Vegas, the podcast where compassion inspires action. Together, we're building a world centered in understanding, empathy, and courageous action, starting right here in the heart of Southern Nevada. We're taking the principle of do unto others as you would have them do unto you to heart. Now, let's welcome a man committed to fostering compassion in every corner of our city, a beacon of compassion in Las Vegas, your host, Will Rucker. Welcome to Compassionate Las Vegas, the podcast. I'm your host, Will Rucker. And I want to thank you for tuning in to this season's podcast. It has been such a great journey and we've had so many amazing guests, but I must admit that today's guest is someone that's really special to my heart. Someone I think that you're going to be inspired by, encouraged by, and just enjoy because she is a truly fantastic human being. Erica Moscow, welcome to Compassion in Las Vegas, the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. That was way too nice. So I'm excited. <laughs> well, I'm I'm just looking back at your journey, our journey, and where you've kind of landed. And I really do stand in awe and with immense gratitude because you are the type of person that changes the world. And you do it with grace, with a smile, with humility and all the right ingredients. So just thank you for being you. Thank you. All right. So with that, I always like to start by level setting, by creating a foundation for our conversation. And that's with asking you to define compassion. So what does compassion mean to you? And how did you come to that understanding? And thank you so much again for having me here today. I know so much of our community, it's about building community. And I believe this is one avenue that we do that. For me, I think of compassion. I really think of empathy. I think of my lived experience being someone that grew up to pretty young parents. My dad immigrated here from the Philippines. He didn't know the language. He earned his GED. He's worked nights my entire life. You know, my parents worked hourly jobs and continued every year to make a little more. So we moved. I went to seven different schools growing up, really never had somewhere to call home. So when I think about compassion, I think of people along the way who helped our family achieve equity and opportunity without looking down on us and understanding that there were systems in place that ensured no matter how hard they worked, uh, it was going to be hard for us. So that's a type of compassion I try to then exude and exemplify in our community. And I love Las Vegas because it is a place that um, became home for me. Thank you for sharing that background and that bit of your story. I didn't realize how many schools you had attended. So that's powerful. My grandmother also went to a ton of elementary schools or schools throughout her, her lifetime. And just the skill set she developed because of that has been, I mean, second to none. She can make friends anywhere because she had to do that growing up, um, but also just understanding diversity and different people in different spaces from street to street. People are just different from house to house, right? So um, you started a little organization uh, that caught fire and uh, worked with young people. So tell us a little bit about that. Yes, I think the thing that I continue to be most proud about in my life is, one, I'm the first in my family to graduate from college. So because of education, I was really able to create that dream and opportunity for my family. And so I became a teacher through Teach for America in 2008. I went to school in Boston. I came here to join the Corps, and I taught in East Las Vegas. I made leaders in training the theme of my classroom because I really believed in ensuring that young people and families could have opportunities to follow any destination that they cared about. And in 2012, so a couple of years after I was a fifth grade teacher, I decided to use my own savings to start a nonprofit for those former youth who are now starting high school. Because I believe that if I really 
believed in the things that I was saying, I had to actually take action. And so it was very difficult. Our first year budget was less than $10,000. I knocked on all students and families' doors. They are the founding members members, and the reason why leaders and training is successful today. Now, 12 years later, I'm not even on the board anymore. So I was the founding executive director. I left to pursue the current thing, which I do, which is represent Assembly District 14 in East Las Vegas. And I'm so proud that leadership and training continues to exist beyond me. I literally have nothing to do with it, but was able to set a foundation. And today my former fifth graders are teachers. I have one as a physician assistant, one is a broadcaster uh, for the local NBC uh, affiliate. And these are young people in our community that we always say, if we can just get the systems right, they will be able to lead their own lives and lead their own communities. And we have examples now of that. And so I'm proud to say that I'm the, I was the, I am the founder and I was the previous executive director of LIT. And, and in that model where you start something and then build it up to the point where it's self-sustaining and then moving on to do the next thing, I think is so critical. When I talk about leadership, I always say leadership has two primary components. One is paving the way, the mm -hmm. other is passing the torch. And so if you're truly a leader, then you're creating an environment for others to rise up and take the reins. So with that in mind, youth has been such a critical focus for so long. I've got to ask, why? Yeah, that, I really love that that is what you think of and what you define as leadership because it's so similar to my values. You know, growing up, I always say there wasn't a Barbie that looked like me. I never had a teacher that looked like me. I never saw someone on the screen that represented my identity. You know, I'm the first Filipina to ever serve in our legislature. And so I feel like it's so important for youth to see examples that they can do it, but not only see examples, have people in their lives paving that path. And so for example, I have a, an Assembly District 14 Youth Committee. Those are young people that I bring with me to events, that plan events in the community that now have the social capital that they can actually do the work because we've done the capacity building. So it's all about making sure this is never about me. And I know that because of my own personal lived experience and background where you know, I always use the example, I did a college access program when I was in high school. I was one of those students and they never told me I could be a leader. They never said, you know, you can rise up and do something to help other people. They just said I should be grateful, you know, for the services that I had. And so my vision has always been, how do we help people become the leaders of their own communities and use their own proximate leadership and experience to solve some of our hardest problems because they actually have the solutions themselves. I think it's really important to share. Really, really important. Um, I want to dive a bit more deeply into Erica though, because uh, we hear, you know, about the work and what you're sharing with others, but I want to hear what really just at a soul level keeps you going, what, what you do for yourself. And that's such an important question. And I'll say I'm always trying to do better, right? Always trying to find models who find that. I don't call it work-life balance. I say, how do you manage the work-life juggle? And so there are a couple things. Um, one, I proudly live in East Las Vegas. When I came to Las Vegas, I lived on uh, Boulder and Harmon in these little apartments across from the dog park. Uh, I then bought our first ever home in our family's history. I bought a town home on Boulder and Tropicana that I lived um, for almost a decade and then bought an uh, actual home, 16 houses down from my Teach for America placement school off of Orchard Valley, where my parents still live today. My husband and I live in the Winterwood neighborhood in East Las Vegas, uh, but always being in the community, I talk about the fact that, you know, I can go to Summerlin or Henderson and be in a board of directors and pitch people for money or go up to Carson City and talk about budgets because I know what it means to run, you know, a six, seven figure budget. However, I come home every day to an area that's very similar to how I grew up. So it allows me to continue to be myself. I think that I'm able to be authentic. I don't have to code switch every day. I've kind of found a way that I can be impactful in the world, in the community, in Nirvana, but I don't have to lose myself. So in some ways, I think that I'm able to 
I guess, surround myself with like never forgetting where I come from because I live on the east side, because I'm in the community, because I understand the issues that everyday people face. And people don't care that I'm a legislator. They don't care that I started a nonprofit. They care about how do you treat them? How do you make sure that you are empathizing, you're not judging, and that you're just continuing to try to be a good community member? Um, that plus I try to go to the gym. I mean, that's like the real thing. <laughs> Try to do my walk and treadmill thing. I'll do all my texts and emails while I'm at the Planet Fitness nearby. Um, and then, of course, my dog. Make sure I walk my dog every day. Also gives me some um, time to just reflect. So I try to do those couple things. All of that's important. And I, I love <laughs> that it's a dog that helps to get you out. <laughs> uh, and you mentioned a, a key word, and I'm going to brag on our state for just a moment. Um, the word you chose was authenticity. And I think that Nevada is so unique in the level of diversity and just to kind of make up a word, allowingness for <laughs> authenticity here, uh, because we do have such a rich culture and such varied experiences. And yet we are uniquely Nevada and Las Vegas in particular is uniquely, I mean, there's no place on the planet like Las Vegas. So really proud of just where we happen to exist at this moment. Um, but I want to dive a bit more into that authenticity piece. Um, as a first time legislator, as the first uh, Filipina to do it, what what does that mean to you? What responsibility do you feel with that? Yeah. And also, like, how do you navigate that for those that are following in your footsteps? Yes, yes, that's a great question. I think in some ways it's always remembering that though I may be the first, I cannot and will not be the last. So I think about so many things that I do, whether it's building coalitions, chairing the ANHPI caucus, bringing people up to Carson City is so that the seats are ready to be filled uh, and then we're not forgetting the people behind us. When I do community events, I find places in our community where we can amplify, bring business to, just let people know, like people don't know there's an Island Pacific, which is a Filipino grocery store on Stuart or Nellis, Stuart and Nellis or uh, Teriyaki Boy is actually a local uh, restaurant that's owned by a Filipina to Omings, which is right in my neighborhood on Nellis and Sahara. So I think it's about building social capital for these groups, making things like our food and our traditions more known out there into the world. And so I think that's my job is, is to one, represent, but then make sure, you know, it's not the only thing I represent. So when I talk about the ANHPI community, I say that many of our issues are the same as every other person um, in our communities, who, whether it's prescription drug prices, whether it's inflation. So it's one, making sure you represent your community, but also making sure you represent the whole community. If you could go back in time to your 12 year old self, what yes. would you tell her? Yes, I would tell her that it's going to be okay. I mean, I, I think my 12 year old self was probably in middle school. At least I only went to one middle school, uh, went to four elementary schools and two different high schools. I think I would tell my elementary school self, I mean, my middle school self that, you know, you're enough, it's going to work out and just continue to trust your instincts. I think that's one part of authenticity that I like to remind our leaders, especially our BIPOC leaders or, or leaders who have lived experiences in the social sector that they're working on. You know, you have all the answers, your gut is correct. And even if it takes many, many years for people around you to understand that, I'm at a place now where, you know, for the first four years of leaders in training, I always had to have another job. We didn't have any other employees. I didn't make a full-time salary. Uh, I experienced the fact we didn't have health care. And so it took many, many years till we could show the results uh, for people to pay attention, which is so interesting because it's it's not the place where I'm in now. So used to always being the underdog. And so it's so interesting to be in a position where maybe people don't count you out anymore. But how do you make sure that they count more people in? Wow. Wow. Yeah. And then what would that 12 year old tell you? Wow. That 12 year old would probably be surprised. I think the 12 year old will say, um, you did a good job and thank you. <laughs> I love that. I love that. 
Well, this is the, the section of the podcast where you get to have a magic wand. And this magic wand does whatever your wildest imagination can create. What's the first thing you use it to do? Wow, 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 wow. Oh, I should have listened to other people's podcasts, right? <laughs> Well, I'll say the one thing when people ask me, like, if I could change anything that had all the resources in the world, uh, you know, I'm a very organized person. So I think about, you know, some actual pragmatic solutions, at least when I think of youth and the work I've done in education. I think if we can connect young people to different services and then actually measure what young people are doing in the communities, I always say, like, young people in leaders and training, they would be in quince practice and then they would have soccer and then they would translate for their parents and then they would babysit. But we don't find a way to capture all of this as actual assets-based, skill-based work and give them credit for it. We also don't measure, you know, if a student was at leaders and training, they could also be in J4NG, they could also be in communities and schools, but we can't measure, you know, where are students, what are they doing? five years later, where are they? 10 years later, where are they? How do we have a system where we can actually measure, balance, have any everyone know the inputs, have everyone know the outputs, have everyone an aligned vision, whether it's a business sector or the community. Uh, to me, I don't know how you do that, but I think by organizing our sector and actually having long-term outcomes and outputs of what all of our systems are doing for students, families, the social sector, healthcare. I think that's when we can really change things because then we can invest people in what are we doing and then what are the outcomes and then how can we change and continually improve based on the data. That's very similar to my magic wand wish, which I'll sum up as one word is collaboration. Um, I, I really, you know, and, and it comes up in so many different ways and it's, it's elusive because we all know like we should collaborate, but then the practical skills are like, wait a minute, like how do we collaborate? Is it putting my logo on your flyer? Is it giving you a check to help you do the work? How do we actually navigate that space? And I think part of that is because we're all trying to number one, survive. <laughs> we're like, gotta take care of home. And then also because we do see things differently. And I think the value of diversity is so understated that if we could really recognize how valuable differing and differences are, we would be able to collaborate at a higher skill set. With that said, you've managed to bring together a lot of people to do good work together. What would you say is your secret to building relationships and connection and fostering collaboration? Yes, thank you. And, and I agree with you. It's it's what are the practical steps of collaboration and how can you see it as useful or helpful to both entities in the end when you can't define that? So I think um, a couple of things in a very practical sense, I would say I'm pretty uh, organized. And, and what I mean when it comes to relationship building is if you give me a business card, I will follow up with you. I know my calendar. I respond to people, you know, not in text very fast, but in emails I do. And so I think in some ways you build relationships with people when you actually do what you say you're going to do. And even if it's just a follow-up phone call where there's actually no action taken, people feel good about the fact that someone listened to them or I followed up with them. I think second, I really do believe in social capital connections for connection's sake, because I know what it's like. So what I used to say is, uh, which is so funny, is not true anymore, but I used to say when I started LIT, I didn't have a network or a net worth. And so I had to figure out how to build that own community itself. And so I think bringing people along in the process, I'm not about, you know, what can I get out of it? I don't think about it like that. I think about how can I create with the position of power that I have structure and systems where people will get together and they'll find their own collaborations within each other. And it's okay that maybe it's five, 10 years down the line, they're like, oh yeah, I worked with you on this one thing, or I met you at this one event. And I think it's allowing people in our world where we need, and yeah, it's so funny because I just talked about results and data, but in our world where we need results and data and outcomes, it's also about, it's okay that if that result data and outcomes comes a very long time from now, and it's also not a linear progression. So at Leaders in Training, we always say there's one example where my mentor now, Ms. Paula Sneed, we met her because one of my students was tabling at an event. He talked, um, 
uh, her husband was having a light event. That student talked to him. You know, he was impressed. He wrote a five hundred dollar check, and then I just followed up for two years. Not because I googled and didn't see who she was, but because I thought it was important that they knew what they were investing in. And then you know, eventually they gave us one of our biggest one term grants um, we ever got. And that wasn't because I was trying to foster our relationship for donations. If that was the case, then that would have been it. But now she's actually my lifelong mentor and has helped me through so many situations. And that's because it was about the relationship. It was about appreciation. It was about compassion and knowing that people don't have to help our nonprofits or our families or our students. But when they do, we also owe them that relationship or that gratitude. So I think people hopefully see that that's my authentic self. I actually do believe all those words that I just said. And I try to exemplify them. And so then I think people usually want to be on on our team because it's not about my team. It's about our team and it's about what we can do for Nevada long term. As we come to our last couple minutes, there are a few things I, I want to dive into. Um, I wish we had more time, but to close, I'm going to ask you to just finish a couple sentences. So whatever pops into your mind first, that's what I want to hear. But before we do that, I want to ask about legislative session. If there was one takeaway from that entire experience, beginning with the campaigning process and then moving into what you're able to actually do as an elected official, what would that one thing be? Yes, I think my one takeaway would be that we really do have to organize the community from a grassroots perspective. And I'm not trying to talk about politics and advocacy groups. I mean, just regular people. We brought up um, regular people to Carson every week, whether it was a constituent bus trip that I paid for to making sure youth could take a spirit flight, you know, for $40 and they've never been on a plane or never been in northern Nevada. But I think it's important for uh, regular folks to have experience in how policies and politics work, not to get anything out of it, but just to allow them to have access so they feel more comfortable uh, to be part of the systems in the future. So that was a wonderful answer. Thank you. And I'm going to just, based on what we've talked about in this 20 minutes we've had together, I don't think you actually learned that in session. I think you brought <laughs> that knowledge with you. Oh, thank so you. So what's one thing you discovered? I'll say it that oh, way. Oh, I love that. Session. I love that. Okay. Uh, one thing that I discovered during session is that what I thought about what a legislator is, is very different than how it actually uh, actualizes out when we are a citizen legislature that only meets every other year and it's an unpaid job. So I have a full time job right now. Everything I do as an elected is on top of it's really community service. So I think in some ways our current governance system does not match. Um, how many uh, people we now have in the state of Nevada. And I think sometimes that's why our social service sector is not where it needs to be. And until we can kind of modernize our governance structure, I think that we're going to continue to only work around the edges. Yeah, that's important for people to hear and know that even in this role where you've got this you know, fancy title and uh, all of that, it really is still service. So thank you for sharing that. As we close, just finish these sentences for me. The first one is what the world needs. What the world needs is more empathy. Mm. Love is. Mm. Wow, that's a good one. I would say uh, love is sacrifice of things that you care about in service of other people and the greater good. I am. Ooh. I am someone who is confident to say they don't know when they don't know. And I think that is one thing that we could all benefit from. Beautiful. Well, Erica, thank you, thank you, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join Compassionate Las Vegas, the podcast. Again, thank you for your service. Thank you for who you, who you are as a human. Is there any final thing you want to leave with our audience? I would just say I'm, I'm so grateful for everybody that's out there and all the work that you do. And I, I remember what it's like to be in direct service and feel like you're in your own little, you know, hamster wheel spinning and spinning and no one notices. Just know you have an impact. We notice and Nevada is better because of all of you. So thank you. Awesome. 
This has been Compassionate Las Vegas, the podcast. I'm Will Rucker. And as I always remind you, you are not just a drop in the ocean. You are the entire ocean in a drop. And what you do matters. So live compassionately. I'll see you next time.